90% of RMs who come home early fall away from the church. I'm like, is that I, supposed I to help why. me? <laughs> like, <laughs> I actually interviewed for a tech job for the church at ICS, and they decided to hire me on as a contract software tester worker. And my first project was missionary with the new call packet upgrades. Even with Temple Worthy, Temple Recommend Holding coworkers, there were still some interpretations on what values and morals meant. For all they say about don't worship idols, I think there is some idol worship going on. We need to be aware of the darkness and call it out for what it is. It seemed like based on how she was acting that she broke her ankle. We prayed and Karen literally laid her hands on Beth's ankle and Beth got up and started walking. Everyone has a journey they're walking. And along that road, we are met with potholes, road bumps, rain, storms, and sometimes just fog. But through it all, we're really just looking for one thing, clarity. Clarity so we can walk with confidence in that next step. There's one source I run to for that clarity. In the darkest of nights, Jesus offers me light that shines through even the thickest storms. Welcome to the Clarity Podcast, where we find clarity through the one who saves us all. I proposed a few months later to Karen, and she said yes, happily. And so she finished up her year at Snow, and this was this went into 2006. So we got married in May 2006. And so that worked out. Jason was admittedly surprised. If I back up to end of 2004, when I would have come home from my mission, but I was starting at Snow then, he's like, well... I knew I had lost my best friend when you started dating. I'm like, no, dude, it wasn't really like that. And but he, he basically said, if you ever hurt my sister, I'll hurt you a lot type <laughs> of thing. And I said, okay, noted. And we noted. moved on. So <laughs> Okay, I won't I'll marry her. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like, how about I marry her instead? And that was 18 years ago. So that mm-hmm. pretty much worked out. But that was basically it. A lot of it was just uh overall healing journey and learning to integrate in a society independent of the church. I did, if I tie it into the church, I did stay active for which I'm somewhat surprised now because I heard a statistic from one of my old bishops. He claimed that like 90%, at least at the time, again, this is dating me like 20 years ago, 90% of RMs who come home early fall away from the church. I'm like, is that I, supposed I to help why. me? <laughs> like, <laughs> it wasn't a super inspiring statistic. Maybe because time. we treat them like dirt. <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm sure like, I mean, in my case, like I said, my ward was about as supportive mm-hmm. as it could have been. Yeah. I did not really have any complaints that way. Mm-hmm. I know not all wards are created equally mm-hmm. in that sense. Mm-hmm. Sounds like yours included. <laughs> Some of your past ones. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, I was grateful for my board members. Yeah. And for the support they gave me. And I learned to get back on my feet again, independent of my overall church identity. It still became, it still was and became a larger part of my identity, especially as I got into college and when we got married because then it was like okay i made this strange detour like this unanticipated but you detour made a but i kind of <laughs> made a comeback so i'm back on the hero journey mm-hmm. type path and we we actually did get married in the mount timpanogos temple i still love that temple overall the the beauty of it and whatnot just in american fork there mm-hmm. in utah valley and it was great overall. They they were very supportive, and the ward was like, "Yay, come back!" And we had we had a, a, a huge for us at least reception with most of our ward, from what I recall, coming because it was like, "You're both from the same ward, yay!" Mm-hmm. And that that was kind of a rarity, at least for us mm-hmm. at the time. But but that led to us at least 
getting married in 2006. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now let's describe your relationship with the church as your newlyweds and starting Mm -hmm. to have kids. Tell me some callings you held and what that was like for your family. Mm -hmm. So that was interesting because for the first few years we got married, we lived with my parents. I had uh, a few of my younger brothers still at home. And so it was like, yay, here's my wife now. And we made it work. And and that's more common now, I think. But for us, it was very comfortable because it was like, hey, we've known your family for like <laughs> a long time. Like I said, we stayed with my parents for the first few years we were married. And our oldest son didn't come along until it was about two and a half years we were married, 2008. And so coincidentally, that coincided with us having saved up for a down payment for a home when houses were actually still more affordable like 15 years ago. And this was closer to the end of 2008. And we'd had enough to buy a house somewhere in the area. And my wife's aunt and uncle helped us out. It was convenient that she was a real estate agent. He was a loan officer. And so we looked at different places. And I guess the Lord works in mysterious ways because... My old scoutmaster told me one day when we were looking, hey, go talk to this guy across the street that was kind of partly active and he had been divorced. And it happened to be literally like four houses down from my (laughs) in-laws. We went and talked to him and he said, well, it's not listed, but I'll give it to you for the remainder of my loan, which was kind of the average house price at the time. This was like probably right around or right after the 2008 like housing market crash and so they also had a first time home buyer credit program at least with the government and it worked out we hadn't anticipated that but bought a house down the street from her parents in Riverton there and around the block from my parents and so we were very active then and even when we first got married for the first several years we were married it was just primary after primary teacher calling and nursery leader, nursery leader, I, th- I think for like the first five years or so. And we moved around the block and I was getting more into my career then. I'd moved on to my first few full-time tech jobs so I could actually support growing family or soon to be growing family and home along with paying the bills. And that was in 2006 to about 2009 and again it was mostly primary nursery teacher calling nursery leader which is fine and (laughs) and that led to in 2009 I actually I got let go from several of my earlier tech companies which was a rude awakening like well no if I do my best it'll just work out and it does, but not always in the way we expect. Mm-hmm. And so now we had a house and I was unemployed. I'm like, now what do we do? And at that time, I didn't mention that close to the time that we moved and got our own house around the block, my wife Karen was actually working for the church. She was working for Beehive Clothing, interestingly, sewing garments. And so she was doing that also alongside my original internship and first few jobs. And she had to wake up super early. It was like 4 a.m. and take tracks like down to close to downtown Salt Lake. And she wasn't making a whole lot hourly, but it was just kind of a weird system there because they had, it was called like, I don't know if this is the exact term, but peace rate or piecemeal rate, something like that. Basically, where if they sew faster, they get a little more money Hmm. type of thing. Interesting. And so it was hourly, but it wasn't much more from what I recall, more than minimum wage, at least for Utah. And there were some concerning aspects of that in terms of like how rich the church is now compared to like what they still may pay them. They were paying minimum wage for this? Uh, It was a little bit more, to be fair. Oh, that's so much nicer. The church is filthy rich. (laughs) What? Yeah. So we we weren't really questioning things then. That that Uh came later. 
but in hindsight i'm like widows might i guess like huh. type of a mentality but it was kind of hard for them too because they had a lot of employees there that i felt like were kind of easily exploited because they had like immigrants like there were a lot from like i didn't work there myself but from what she told me like from tonga and uh, some latina ladies and i felt like they were just in more of a situation and this may not be true for all of them but where it was like hey we just we need some sort of job this is kind of a more entry-level job we can get training on the job and to be fair also that they did give them some training it was just it was a challenging work environment from what i heard like it was like keeping up with the quota type of a thing like with these sacred garments and at the time we took it very seriously like it was like well we're not prospering as much materially or monetarily but this very mission is the most important mission in terms of supporting god's kingdom on the earth type of a mentality and i think there's some truth to that it did help us get into our home for which i'm grateful and so we we get to where i'm unemployed and my wife had actually quit shortly after our first son was born so she she went on maternity and then just didn't go back and so we get 2009 i'm going to school off and on part-time then because i was working too and all of life these life events start happening at once and it was a few months later that i actually interviewed for a tech job for the church at ics information communication services they had moved from downtown salt lake to riverton incidentally my hometown a few months before and they decided to hire me on as a contract software tester worker and my first project was missionary with the new call packet upgrade and so that was really nice for me because we have benefits again hey we can keep our house i can pay the the bills again and so that led to the start of overall about a 10-year career with church tech employment and for me that was a significant part of my life because that's half my career, right? Mm -hmm. And there were numerous positive and negative aspects about that. I would say comparable to tech career, corporate careers in general, there were just some unique aspects I see differently now, kind of like with beehive clothing, where it's like, well, it was definitely a lot more <laughs> than minimum wage. At the same time, from what I understood, it was still below tech job average. Hmm. And I kind of knew that, but at the time, my mentality was, well, there's no greater work than this. And I was very sincere mm -hmm. about that. Like, I don't mean to demean that. I just have kind of a different perspective now with knowing how rich the church is and how much they were willing to pay out even for like tech jobs. I really feel like there, there was some manipulation in the sense of well you have better benefits and they did have great insurance overall we have to keep in mind the widow's might that was that was kind of a, a mantra almost where it was like well we don't have quite enough budget for this because we have to consider the wi widow's might type of a thing mm -hmm. so in any case that along with some of my other callings that went into really a lot of the next 10 years of my life and just working on several different teams there it was a different dynamic and at the time i really was invested in that and i made a lot of great friends there it was very different i saw this in hindsight weird culture overall of mixing in secular corporate aspects in the church as a corporation type aspect intermingled Mm. We, for our morning status update meeting, for example, each day, had prayer. And I I still think that's an overall great thing. It's just there are numerous interesting aspects of how it is when you're working within a corporate church structure. 
So tell us a little bit about your work environment uh-huh. there. And was it good, bad? Yeah, I'd say overall it was very good. And not all teams, I would say, are created equal. Mm-hmm. And there were some eye-opening things. One, knowing that even with temple-worthy, temple-recommend holding coworkers, which is, as I understand, still a requirement, there were still some interpretations on what values and morals meant some of coworkers behaviors like in terms of nothing huge at least from what i knew but like oh i didn't know some of my coworkers swear you're not supposed to swear like in this type of environment <laughs> okay so not implying like anything super shady or anything but just okay. realizing oh even church members temple recommend holders have differing um uh, views on Mm -hmm. things and their own struggles too but overall it was very positive because i like i said i met a lot of friends during that time period Mm -hmm. and at the time also i really was invested in well if the church is the lord's kingdom on the earth then this is just an extension of that and so it was pretty easy for me to overlook well i don't get paid quite as much but there was kind of this undercurrent mentality of, well, you'll be blessed more for Mm. service, for serving either on the missionary projects. Later on, I worked for their, basically their call center portfolio department for giving customer service to like bishops and state presidents, et cetera. So I did learn quite a few things about, well, these are real people and this is how the church operates in a more corporate structure. I also learned that their HR department to me seemed really powerful compared to like other HR departments. And often I felt like employees could be really on edge, not just with, I guess there's this aspect where it's like, well, I have to maintain my worthiness to keep a temple recommend or my very job could be in jeopardy. Like I was very active during that time and that was never a real concern of mine. But I could see like in a few instances, coworkers being really concerned, like if I get the wrong bishop or if my bishop gets mad at me for whatever reason, Mm -hmm. my job is tied in to my ability to provide like a livelihood. And I feel like there's this undercurrent of extreme anxiety and even stress i I wonder if that causes an undercurrent of lying to just to get your temple recommend so you can keep your job sometimes in some cases Mm -hmm. i think there were a few instances like with other coworkers. i obviously won't won't name names but Mm -hmm. where there was some truth to that it created unnatural pressure Mm -hmm. ironically to lie so they could keep paying the bills or not lose their their home so i mentioned that like as a potential darker aspect and not every day was really like that for me it was Mm -hmm. to emphasize very overall positive but i was also very super active like let's go let's complete the work Mm -hmm. and it was overall i'd say a very positive work environment knowing that i work with all these people you assume you can trust because they have more or less the same values Mm -hmm. so some of my best friend teammates and co-workers there are some i still know i still associate with and others have moved on to different places but i i as a whole wasn't looking at them like well can i really trust you or not like i i wasn't in that mentality where Mm -hmm. even looking back it was like well we're all just taught to lie it wasn't really like that i just feel like it creates this artificial undercurrent of some of that maybe more at the management level because i was only like an engineer but i did see there was some discrimination again more subtle i feel like towards female or women employees there you inevitably unfortunately i feel like have that when you have this type of a culture within like a church type setting environment because the expectation was and i feel like is in a lot of ways still well even if a woman is here 
for her career type of a thing, there's still like the end goal expectation of you need to become a mother in Zion and eventually leave the job. So again, to emphasize, I did not really see that personally. I sometimes heard of occasional secondhand meetings where sometimes there were like discriminatory phrases said, even if they weren't fully aware of it type of a I situation. Think it's kind of a society thing. Women have to work twice as hard to prove themselves in the workforce. Mm-hmm. And that's just, and like, I am not a feminist in any way, shape or form. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. But there is something to be said for, you know, uh, I can be working with a customer and they will be like a lot more nitpicky with me than they will with the main man or the boss, mm-hmm. because that's just kind of how it is. Right. And so that probably does totally leak into the church because we're taught, these are the priesthood holders. These are the men, this is their role. Mm-hmm. And there's like a lack of partnership understanding that mm-hmm. sometimes we got to pay the bills folks. <laughs> right. You know, I could see that to some degree, even in our early marriage, mm-hmm. like I'd probably cringe at, sometimes the way I acted Mm. where it was like I had assumptions like well I'm the breadwinner so we spend our money this way Mm -hmm. hopefully my wife wouldn't point out too many of those aspects but inherently I think in that culture like you're saying Claire that's true Mm -hmm. like whether we want to see that or not Mm -hmm. so in any case I I feel like I learned from that and made some great friends there we played ultimate frisbee I still play with them on occasion, some of my friends there. that That's how long some of those relationships can mm-hmm. last there. And so Karen, meanwhile, at home was starting to raise our kids. Mm-hmm. Like we had our first son and every two years until 2020, we had a kid every year. If you do the math between 2008 and 20, that's seven kids. Yep. And so we end up with five wonderful boys and, and two girls with my church culture, you know, corporate experiences, that's basically the gist of it. Again, I have very positive experiences with coworkers and I did appreciate a lot of the common values we had. It's just tricky because some of their HR values were things like, I'm paraphrasing, but basically aware of the widow's might. They actually, in the HR sense, did highlight that. And there was this fear of like, I don't want to overspend on budget or you don't get out of line morally. Like in our orientation, it's the only place I've been. And I agree with it in theory overall, one strike you're out. If you ever got caught with porn there, you're out, you're just terminated. So there's a very real fear and motivation. Don't ever look at porn if you want a church career, which wasn't an issue with me. Like I said, (laughs) as a teen, I was terrified of you know the whole porn industry like i never got involved in that but one of the values was and still is i believe aligned with the brethren so if you're questioning anything about the church that becomes quickly problematic if you're tying that in to follow the prophet yeah so this is where it gets sticky and that Mm -hmm. i'm not even sure if i disagree with the idea that as a company any company if someone if an employee is using porn on company mm-hmm. play yeah fire them like okay. right i i don't disagree <laughs> with that against your company policy uh-huh. like that's awesome what blows my mind is when we're lumping porn with not following the profit like mm-hmm. that's and when it's it, weird it, there's this weird mixed mentality mm-hmm. within that or intertwined not mixed maybe for all they say about don't worship idols in hindsight again I think there is some idol worship going on because one of the benefits they highlighted was twice a year they would have a special devotional and they actually used the term devotional where weeks in advance they would say we are going to have a visiting general authority and we put on our calendar and it was like Christmas in some ways and it was like kind of this like roulette thing like are we going to get an apostle or is it just going to be a 70 like you had <laughs> th- so these sad. whole discussions like if we're really lucky maybe first presidency but no they're probably too busy as it is that is so sad <laughs> like literally any good person could get up and give a speech in front of a group mm-hmm. of people <laughs> so not to i don't necessarily say that 
to be facetious or mm-hmm. demean leaders. It's just there. It was especially notable. We never did have a first presidency member, from what I recall. But there were several times an apostle came. And if you want to talk about like celebrity culture, at least within a church context, that's the place you'll see it at. Because we made sure that we were early. We got to the first floor conference room was the Zion conference room, their biggest conference room. And that's where the apostle would come. I remember Elder Bednar came to one of those. It made a big impression on me at the time. And I have a different perspective on that now. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I remember he highlighted or he said was, again, kind of paraphrasing maybe, he was saying this job is not a calling or this, your career, something like that. Your role here is, is not a calling, but it's more than a job. And that was a quote that... From what I recall, they they featured like on their HR portal, you know, Mm -hmm. logging in and they would have inspirational quotes like this. And I'm all for like inspirational quotes. But if you're talking about kind of culty behaviors sometimes or like celebrity culture, I know in the church handbook, they say we discourage asking general authorities for autographs, but that was about as close as you got. I had, to be clear again, excellent overall experiences with my church job career and I feel very happy overall with my overall work that I accomplished there. I just feel like some of the not so great aspects are easily overlooked at times. I just feel like that that is one unique aspect, at least in my journey, of having a 10 year inside mm-hmm. look yeah, for of sure. church employment. All right, so let's transition into your awakening journey. So mm-hmm. you have been a super faithful <laughs> member, like your whole life, okay? Right. This isn't like you just weren't reading your scriptures or no. not going to church or slacking off or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Like it seems like you were pretty faithful in your personal life and in your church life, so mm-hmm. private and public life. What happened? <laughs> what, a what, lot of What was the first step to your happened. awakening journey? Like I said, the first step may have been like subconsciously, I think that was the word Mm -hmm. from my mission and feeling like, well, I'm the problem. The church can't be the problem. And to be fair, my issues weren't really directly tied into like church issues, like at the time or even church Mm -hmm. policy. That was more of a, we need to figure out a better way to help troubled missionaries or Mm -hmm. youth, et cetera. But for us overall, even years after, like I worked for 10 years for church employment for most, I'd say the vast majority of that time, because this was between 2009 and 19 that I was in, I was not questioning. We were taught, again, in a very conformity type culture, you defer to authority. And I thought that was the right thing. I still do in terms of deferring to God and Jesus. So I would say it really started with a few events that caused a slow simmer, like in 2015 or so. We started reading some materials that were kind of unique outside the church, not like anything anti-LDS or anti-Mormon. Some of this coincided with our medical journey of attempting to be more independent of Western medicine. My wife originally started learning about energy healing, like in general, Mm -hmm. and took a few in-person type classes, just kind of like general holistic alternative forms of healing, as as Mm -hmm. some may label it. And she had some very positive experiences from that. And she was basically saying in some ways, wow, I think there's a lot of power in this, but this doesn't mesh well with like deferring to priesthood authority. And at the time, maybe I was more of an ideal husband in this sense. I was like, well, maybe there's some truth to that because I already had kind of a worthiness complex, at least feeling like to some degree lingering inferiority complex and feeling like I just didn't identify or fit in super well, even with my young men, quorums, even elders later on. I felt like I respected the guys overall and got along with them. 
not like for me at least currently necessarily I wanted to just start attending Relief Society, but I felt like I had uh, a very large respect for the at least potential power of women. And unfortunately, I feel like within the church culture, it's very easy for them to feel marginalized. So we started learning more about that and started seeing some positive effects. And I think with, is it Meriden? Did you Mm -hmm. interview? Meriden Tombs, yeah. Yeah, so I was like, I can can resonate with a lot of what you're saying Mm -hmm. with uh, energy work and energy healing Mm -hmm. in general, especially with the concept of like trapped emotions and Mm -hmm. emotions getting stuck in your body. And the church Mm -hmm. doesn't really teach this. They say you get a priest of blessing and you go on your way, Mm -hmm. you know, in essence. Yeah. Well, this this is a heated debate in all different communities and all different Mm -hmm. groups is, is energy medicine witchcraft. In my opinion, no. No. Nope. That's my experience. <laughs> I agree. I don't. No. Can people use it for witchcraft? Yeah, I mm-hmm. think they can. I agree. I too. totally <laughs> think they can. But I think that it depends on your intention and it depends on where does your power come from? Mm-hmm. Is your power coming from a person? Is it coming from you or is it coming from Christ? Right? Exactly. And so when we yeah. learn to harness that, that power, and people, mm-hmm. you know, people will say things like energy medicine is of the devil. We heal through the word. Well, what is the word? It's energy, okay? Mm-hmm. Priesthood blessings, prayer, it's all energy. Mm-hmm. And so when we recognize where our power comes from, which is Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. no, I don't, anything can be used for evil, right? Yep. Use it for good. That's kind of my take on it. I very much agree with that. And I'm still very much a newbie to a lot of that. Mm-hmm. I do study a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge reader, library guru, right. for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. I do agree that really all matter in one form or another is really a form of energy. Mm-hmm. And all matter with energy vibrates at a different level, mm-hmm. whether higher or lower. And I think entities are very much aware of that and attempt to disrupt our energetic and auric fields. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that just can be intertwined Mm -hmm. together. And like you were saying, I watched your own interview. I very much agree in the concept of spiritual warfare, that Mm -hmm. we need to be aware of the darkness Mm -hmm. and call it out for what it is. So this really tied a lot into overall a lot of what we are learning with energy work and energy healing. Because Mm -hmm. a big part of that, like I believe Meriden said, was casting out entities Mm -hmm. and getting rid of curses, even Mm -hmm. generational curses, et cetera. So that was really a lot of what we were starting to learn about and starting to see a disconnect with the church Mm -hmm. and deferring to church leaders and church authority. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, I very much was a poster boy Mm -hmm. for deferring to church authority. Mm -hmm. I was very much and still am in some ways a people pleaser. And so we start having kind of this disconnect. And at the time, it was more of an underground disconnect. <laughs> it like, always starts as an <laughs> yeah, underground it's disconnect. It's just like this, not like it's this revolution or this mm-hmm. uprising that needs to happen. <laughs> Let's go to church and tell people about energy medicine. <laughs> right. It's like two arms like type of a thing. It, it wasn't yeah. like that. Mm-mm. It was just during that time, my wife started to have some very special experiences with that. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I was overall supportive. I did take a year break from church employment and I, uh, for a time got hired on it. I'm not sure if it's appropriate to call out like mainstream names or not, but doTERRA, right? The wellness essential oil company. Sorry. I I probably made it sound like some dark (laughs) secret company. No, the, the point was they were in our still wellness company Mm -hmm. and a lot of their market and their focus is on essential oils which Mm -hmm. happens to coincide well in some ways with some Mm -hmm. alternative alternative forms of healing Mm -hmm. and alternative medicine that we learned hey we resonate more and more with compared Mm -hmm. to some western medicine but so there was that and then there was also we started reading other type of materials like near-death experiences Mm -hmm. that weren't necessarily, again, anti. Mm -hmm. I'm probably sounding like we're starting in these secret dark (laughs) 
materials. Like I don't mean NDEs it like that. NDEs are like <laughs> NDEs. <anti. laughs> so it's not necessarily anti. It was just in my mind at the time. It wasn't the prophet. So, you know, yeah, not a good I guess source. that could be considered in general sense anti <laughs> for what it's worth. But we started reading more of these experiences and some of them didn't fully match up with our overall concept of both creation and our overall journey with what is in eternity and what is in the afterlife and are there angels are there demons ghosts etc type mm-hmm. of a thing but more importantly not so much that it had wildly differing beliefs but it was very eye-opening in the sense of a lot of these stories have people featured or the authors or the experiences they relay that are not LDS, that are not Mormon, that sometimes they're not even Christian, and they may or may not have become Christian after they saw this light at the end of the tunnel or these afterlife visions that didn't quite gel or coincide with the church's mainstream narrative, Mm -hmm. at least with their mainstream beliefs in the sense of like plan of salvation. Sometimes it's like, that's a little different, but okay. So anyway, not to belabor the point, but that that was really the beginnings of that, kind of slow simmer for several years. And in 2017, it was a talk, I want to say like the track or the journey continues by at the time, Elder Ballard, where I was really stressed for a while because I was like, this doesn't make sense. He was overall calling out alternative forms of healing Mm -hmm. and energy work. And I think he may have used the term energy work, but he's basically saying, do not stray from the authority of the priesthood for paying money. And at the time I was like, wait, pay money for healing? What about most, like, that's a huge catch-all. What about most medicine? paying money (laughs) to get medications. So by that definition, all y'all need to stop going to the doctors. By that broad (laughs) categorization, yes. (laughs) (laughs) I remember feeling very troubled by that because I know he, he specifically called out MLMs in general. And I'm, I'm like, well, I can... In general, maybe be on board with that. Right. Yeah, use common sense. Sure. But the context it was used in was very troubling because the overall narrative of that was very much do not, and he actually said in that talk, do not listen to those with differing beliefs. Like flashbacks of Nelson like, about a year ago. <laughs> yeah, and I was shocked when I reread that part of it. But mm. While they're also, this is also the time where they're pushing medications in other talks too. Right. Like, you know, mm-hmm. looking at the staff means taking your medications. Exactly. No, it doesn't. <laughs> at the time, I remember just feeling pretty troubled because I was like, wait, we've seen some very positive mm-hmm. things from this. And I was actually, for most of that time, in church employment still. And for me, it was like, just put this on this shelf and just kind of tuck it away. And I didn't think a whole lot of it because I still felt like, well, I can still answer the temple recommend questions. Like Mm -hmm. we just have like this. And it wasn't even like a secret double life because even my mom has, has read to some degree a little bit about like energy healing Mm -hmm. and like she works for IH for Intermountain Health, mm-hmm. and I feel like we can have dualistic beliefs in some in some aspects. So mm-hmm. anyway, that was basically it for a few years. That was just kind of the undercurrent. In more like 2019, we were reading more NDEs, and we were seeing some uh, podcasts and uh, a few other places where we were kind of troubled with what they're saying in general conference. And again, we weren't looking into like really any of these anti-literature things because I was scared, to be honest, of looking into those. I'm like, well, that leads you down the, the dark path. That mm-hmm. leads you down at best to like mm-hmm. celestial kingdom mm-hmm. because I really did believe this is the true church. And I've spent a lifetime of checking off 
all these chat boxes. I want to be one of the chosen. Mm -hmm. I want to be a celestial kingdom hero in that sense Mm -hmm. and, and live that life. And I still agree with the overall morals, but the point was we were just disagreeing with more things. We were seeing different aspects. Like in general conference, it was like, well, maybe they they're just they don't know about that, or maybe someone just needs to tell them otherwise. Some of it seemed a little silly in hindsight, but I think my wife was starting to disagree more with polygamy with some of what she was hearing. And she came in one day and she's like, I knew it. Polygamy is not of God with section 132 because even if I read it now, I'm just like, oh, it's so cringy. Like Joseph Smith could not have written that. I know the church officially says he did. And so that was one of the aspects where, again, it wasn't just saying one source. We were not just like fixated on we're going to prove this wrong. It was just like, wait, maybe we need to stay or take a, step back and consider with this because to be honest i was more concerned about my own health and well-being for most of the time to not worry about like polygamy if i really think about now i'm like yeah that's wrong that's an abomination right (laughs) that's that's adultery plain and simple Mm -hmm. you can't have dualistic beliefs in that area sorry that's that's my (laughs) the church wants to make (laughs) us think that we can (laughs) yeah i know they say like with nelson and President Oaks, like, well, they're, they are practicing spiritual polygamy, but they're like, well, it's temple authorized. So they're just things like that. And again, we were not actively looking for reasons to question. A lot of it was just our journey where it was like we came across something and we were like, whoa, wait, whether it was like polygamy or a little bit later on, like with uh, revised church history, like, Others have said the very Joseph Smith papers will show you there were revisions, especially after Joseph Smith was martyred. So that just, that really, a lot of that just tied in with 2020. And it may sound cliche, but March came and I got sent home to work remotely. By that time, I left doTERRA after a year because. They just got really super busy with their work schedule, and I needed more of work-life balance along with some of my coworkers. And I went back on one more church contract for two years in missionary supporting the online teaching center, which was great overall. That lasts for two years. They used to have more of a model of you can be contract or what they call contingent for up to two years. By that time, my two years was up for my last contract. I needed employment, and I ended up going somewhere else. And so by that time, 2020, I was at my last company, and we all got sent home to work remotely. And then all the big C events started happening with all the health scares and whatnot. And pretty quickly, I was both my wife and I were on the same page that this is not right. We should not be afraid of narratives that are being pushed, and we were starting to question more things. And with the church shutting down, my son and I went to the Jordan River Temple early March. He had turned 12. We were still in enough that he got ordained to be a deacon. And the next week, they shut everything down. And we were like, something's not right here. Why, if this is Jesus's church, are they just going along with everything that the government, which we are highly disagreeing with right now, are pushing. And so in a lot of aspects, we share a lot of the similar beliefs, at least with, from what I've seen with others, like-minded with that. And that led to some arguments, even within our family's text threads. And we decided we need to take a break for a little while because we are of opposing viewpoints to what our our family is thinking and pushing. And to be fair to them, they were scared. Like we all were, I think, to one degree or another. And society was just going crazy. So that was a big part of it. We did not agree with these face coverings. And even when church reopened for us, as I recall, it reopened kind of virtually for a little while, and then they, they opened up in person in our local area. 
And they were heavily pushing from these letters that the brethren were giving to the bishop, these face coverings. And we had our, our youngest daughter in summer of that year of 2020. And so we were like, well, we, agree, we disagree with this anyway. We're not going to go in that type of setting. And so we were a mystery for probably a year or so to the ward because they probably thought we were just very scared. And it wasn't really so much that, but I wasn't wanting to be super political about it. We just very much disagreed with those mandates. And I started attending virtually again until probably like 2021. And then they lightened up on the coverings because of the jabby jab push in, <laughs> in the next year. The jabby jab. <laughs> I've heard it called like the polka doodle and all sorts of stuff. But in any case, we very much disagree with that with some of our overall health experiences too. We had differing views and for us that, w- that was okay. I did get frustrated because for about a month, I would have literally been guilty in their eyes of, um, uh, I think it was a misdemeanor B for gathering in groups of 10 or more for wanting to play ultimate Frisbee. We usually have five verse five or up to seven verse seven. And so I was ready to break the law for about a month there because I was fed up with that. That might have actually been 2020, but in any case, we were disagreeing with a lot of that. And Mm -hmm. some of that may sound cliche, but we were like-minded to a lot of us who have those opinions. When tyranny becomes law, um, rebellion becomes Re- duty. Re- exactly. <laughs> so. Rebellion becomes duty. Yep. That was very troubling for me because I'm not a rebel. Like, <laughs> No, you are not. Being rebellious to me is like, I marked up a library book. Now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> That's about the extent, to be mm-hmm. honest. So most of my, I'm not saying that to tout myself it's just Mm -hmm. i was pretty squeaky clean Mm -hmm. and yet had more guilt than the average person which (laughs) that's uh, the unfortunate (laughs) right yes okay what else what other things were you waking up to eventually i did go back in person briefly in summer of 2021 to our home ward and maybe i can regret that in hindsight because like after two weeks my bishop rick counselor uh, asked me to be a monthly gospel doctrine teacher. So I'm like, well, that's what I get for going that. But no, I, w- I was very sincere about it. I remember talking to Karen and she didn't really even want to attend Relief Society virtually because she's like, I'm just not feeling like the spirit. And in yeah. hindsight, in most of my previous church meetings, I struggled to feel the spirit. There were times And I even remember, I forgot to mention, but there was a time during my church work experience where I got super zealous about family history work. And like I said, my dad was a convert and I was like, all right, the field is white, ready to harvest. And since he was a convert, there was like no one on his side who had had the work done. And I did very sincerely the work for hundreds of names during my church work tenure because three miles up the road was the Oker Mountain Temple. I literally would go and do an endowment. This is how dedicated I was. 5.30 a.m. session at Oker Mountain and I heard that they just, I guess I missed that train, but they just shortened the endowment session again to like an hour now. But these are hour and a half, between hour and a half, two hour sessions. I was doing that before work or instead of going playing ultimate frisbee at lunch or going to lunch with my coworkers, at times I would go do baptisms for the dead, fit that in at lunch. So I was very sincere in that. And I did hundreds of names and I know others have done more. I'm not saying that necessarily to compare. I'm just saying for me, that's a lot with family and work Mm -hmm. and all of that. I sometimes even joked a little about it. Like I would wear my suit to the Riverton office and it was business casual and I cringe at being kind of self-righteous, but I was in, in some ways, but like I was at the temple. <laughs> yeah. The point was I was very sincere and mm-hmm. I consider that like a, an unofficial calling 
in one calling I forgot to mention around that time too, some of that same time was Scoutmaster. Mm. We went to Bear Lake also and it was a big struggle at times because I graduated from Weber with my bachelor's like in 2014 and I was also Scoutmaster right before that and I was also working a full-time job and doing my other church work. Mm. So we were just super busy and my biggest goal with being scoutmaster end up being keep the scouts alive really mm. and so i'm happy i i feel like i succeed at that but we were viewing more content like podcasts and whatnot again not really anti like lds type information it mm-hmm. was just some of it like i said was just like learning about revised church history stuff and mm-hmm. some of it they would very much label anti-mormon content for which i'm like fine if this is what is true so be it well and, and you have content like michelle brady stone 132 problems right. she's active mm-hmm. member of the church and that's still anti-content it's like okay and, <laughs> and those like and i've really appreciated like her work with that and hers with that that was a little later but that just tied into what I was Mm -hmm. becoming awake to and being troubled by. Like one of the significant ones was like Justin Griffin's Mm. who killed Joseph Smith. Did you feel like that was anti when you first found it? No, by that time, by that time you're like, no, it it was, yeah. Like (laughs) it was probably later on 2021. Mm -hmm. And so some of this coincided with, we decided to move from Riverton not because we were like, oh, we've got to get away from all these active LDS. Mm-hmm. Because up until that point, like I did teach gospel doctrine a few months, mm-hmm. we decided to move mostly because it was especially my wife's dream to get more land mm-hmm. and to be able to accommodate for very much a growing family because by that time we had seven kids and we, we still have seven, but the point was we were, we were very full, and especially in terms of land. My wife wanted more land, and so we moved up to the Preston, Idaho area and got five acres. So we have lots of animals and, and whatnot there too. But some of this, it may look like it coincided with us running away shamefully, but I already had all the shame I wanted from or needed from feeling like a failed RM. And I had worked my way through that. Mm-hmm. So in any case, we we just got to the point where we were like, it's okay. Like church, even ward members, we love them overall. I greatly respect, especially really all my bishops mm-hmm. I've had. And so we had the potential for them to think we were running away. But mm-hmm. so be it, you know, in terms of looking for the truth. But the main point was we moved because we want more land. It, it just happened to coincide with we were very much questioning things then and felt like with a lot of what we were learning, again, with very carefully selected podcasts and whatnot, I really was not seeking out anti-literature just to justify, like, this is why I believe this. It just, it really coincided with that. So we moved and I hold my home ward members in very high esteem and the bigger issue probably was the general authorities themselves, like with newer general conference talks about ties in with the UN Mm -hmm. and where tithing was actually going and them lying about it, Mm -hmm. like with shell corporations and where they were actually investing that with pharmaceuticals, real estate even, when you're talking about $100 million plus dollar temples as beautiful as they are that's a lot and one plus billion dollar city creek malls for me it was more about not so much just that but what is this taking away from those who really need it in our local communities because i was finance clerk for like five years and we had a pretty self-sufficient ward overall but the state could come in and say give it to us and it would just disappear into this black hole so there were just numerous cascading effect things there too. And and I did come to the belief, and I'm still of the mindset that I could be wrong in some things. It's just when you start getting second, third, fourth, 
witnesses, even with something like Brigham Young, I believe, hijacking the church Mm -hmm. and probably having a plot to take over and likely this inside job, like with what Justin Griffin was showing, that's very troubling. And you still can't prove that Joseph Smith had any more descendants than who he said he did Mm -hmm. and any more wives Mm -hmm. than Emma, aside from some secondhand testimony or witnesses that weren't really reliable in the first place. Like I read Whitney Horning's book, like a lot of others, Joseph Smith Revealed, and that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And so you know Brigham Young had, I believe, 50-plus wives Mm -hmm. and somewhere in the realm of 10 divorces. Divorces. Mm -hmm. And with DNA, we have nowadays literal descendants of Brigham Young. And so I'm not saying that to focus in great detail on Brigham and the evils overall he may or may not have done. Some of that I know is speculation. Mm -hmm. But when you look at history and historical events, stuff starts adding up, especially with revised church history. It all becomes kind of tangled, Mm -hmm. like how they handle church uh, abuse cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying necessarily just like the individual bishop, but having a church hotline where they, the local leaders, bishops, state presidents, as I understand, I've never been a bishop, but from what I understand, they are directed to, that feels more like a PR effort to preserve Mm -hmm. reputation rather than protecting victims. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what is your relationship with Jesus Christ looking like at this time while you're, you know, Mm -hmm. having this huge awakening, (laughs) okay? Are you just, is this all in your head? Like, it's got to be a partnership with Jesus Christ when these things happen. So tell us about that in your life. I was learning much more to rely on going in prayer directly. I know we were taught that. That's the general outline. You pray to Heavenly Father, you ask for blessings, you thank Him, you ask for blessings. But for me, a lot of that became much more personal because I was going through a lot of overall dissonance with feeling so troubled about this because my wife was always, I feel like, one step ahead of me, coming to a conclusion of this isn't right. You know, like with the 2021 First Presidency letter where they, and earlier in the year, are saying, get this, it's safe and effective listen to the wise and thoughtful government leaders, there's a huge dissonance when I realized, no, they're not. And I I argued with individuals over this isn't right. Jesus would have us heal. I argued one time against someone who was saying, well, Jesus would be leading the mass brigade. That's when I learned to be more bold. And I feel I stand up for Jesus. And I said, no, he would not. What about the leper colonies? I'm not saying everyone should necessarily just put themselves in danger, but when when Jesus, in that sense, was one of the only ones willing to go and heal and use like the godly priest of power, he became more real to me. And when I came to the conclusion that I literally have to be termed a villain and be okay with that, that was a big wake-up call, knowing that In my view, my belief, if I want to have this direct connection, independent of authority to Jesus, I have to go against what mainstream is saying, whether in society or government leaders or the media, not to be rebellious because it's what I believe is right. And I learned much more to rely on him and to pray, I can't do this alone. I need to know if I'm wrong, I'm one of the first and foremost to admit it and repent because that's truly what I want. And when that means going against what family members are saying and thinking we're crazy and being a literal spiritual renegade and thought of as as commands spiritual suicide, if that's what it means, to stand up for what is truth and right. That's what I have to do. And I learned to have a much more direct connection, look to him as much more of a friend and brother in that sense, even if it meant 
soft shunning or open shunning, but knowing that Jesus himself on the earth had to go against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the established experts and authorities, should we not be willing to follow Jesus if that's what it takes? So are you saying that there are people in the church who are like the Pharisees? I believe so. I would say that from everything I observe with my local ward leaders, if that's who we only ever associate with, then no, I wouldn't say that. There are some of the kindest, most genuine spiritual leaders and people I've worked alongside of. In terms of the fall of the prophet mandate and what I perceive as lies, not just with all these health-related events in terms of society, which I feel like the church did not have a place in, then yeah, I came to the conclusion that President Nelson, unfortunately, is lying. That led me to view a lot of what they're saying as something that could not be trusted and how hard they're pushing the covenant path and temples, which I'm troubled with because I went hundreds of times, not so much that I genuinely gave my time, but when Satan himself says, you're naked, see, go put this apron on. Are we not literally obeying him in the endowment itself? And just some of what I view as potential darker aspects when we're talking about potential entity interference that goes completely against what active LDS would say. Mm -hmm. They may think we're crazy, but if that means that's what we have to do to follow Christ, and I've grown up almost 40 years of going through a lot of painful processes with, am I clean? How do I be more pure? How do I repent? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do to follow you? It is one of the hardest hero paths that I could envision and that I've embarked on. I feel like even if it means I'm considered a layman or lemuel or an outright villain, I mean, that's how serious I am. And my wife, Karen, I believe would agree with too, to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it takes. And with her power, with what I've experienced working together with her, we've had miracles with following Jesus in that sense. Like I have come to a far greater appreciation of working as a partner in equality with my wife. What we have experienced together in terms of true godly power. I don't mean to say I discredit priests of power. I just think it's more than that, especially involving women and Mm -hmm. their inherent power, your inherent spiritual power. I think priesthood power comes directly from Jesus Christ and both men and women have access to it when they have faith in his name and are repenting of their sins. It's so simple. (laughs) Faith, repentance. Mm -hmm. So simple. I fully agree with that. And we've seen literal miracles with that. It's not so much about the alternative forms of healing, whether herbs or energy healing, etc. I give Mm -hmm. credit for that. But having that direct connection to Jesus, and I'm very much imperfect, I'm still striving to have that personal connection and to someday have that very personal interaction and reunion again with, with Christ. But we've literally seen Miracles, even with me being guided, when we first moved to Preston, our daughter Beth, she was a year and a half old at the time and got very sick. She wouldn't stop throwing up. And we took her in to Instacare and even the ER several times. And they said, well, it looks like the flu type thing. And I literally called like the next night because she was just getting worse. And they said, well, these are flu symptoms they take some time to recover from. And the next morning, I was concerned enough that I rushed her back in. And over a series of events, they did tests, took us by ambulance to Ogden, life flighted us to Salt Lake to Primary Children's, and found out she had swallowed a little button bead magnet from a little kid's set. 
and a little button battery and it had obstructed her intestines. So for me, it's not always so much about instant miracle that has occurred at times, but it's just as much about being guided because we wouldn't have our precious daughter if we had just gone along with that. And like a year later, our daughter, same daughter Beth, fell heavily like on her ankle and she was limping very hard on it and it it seemed like based on how she was acting that she broke her ankle. We prayed and Karen literally laid her hands on Beth's ankle and Beth got up and started walking. So it's like, how do you explain things like this if not for the very power of Christ? One of our younger sons had a few spider bites. I believe it was like black widow bite. And we we did use um, several alternative like treatments like uh, bentonite clay packs, but also, again, prayer and using what I would probably say is the priest of power, godly power, Christ's power, and he was healed. I say that, too, with knowing that there are life and death situations, right? Like with Beth, we spent five weeks at Primary Children's, and there are valid cases, I would definitely say, for modern Western medicine with saving life. The point is, it truly is through the power of Jesus Christ that, one, we enter into his presence again, and two, can have that direct power for the service of our fellow beings. I think that we are trained in society and in church culture that when you're in a panic situation, your first option is to run to the hospital. Like We are just mm-hmm. trained to do that. And so if you, if your first panic response is to run to God, that's considered pretty crazy in mm-hmm. today's society. But I think if that's our first panic response, we're going to be better off and God will show us what to do next. Mm-hmm. It seems like those are the patterns that you were learning and that you, that's when we really start to see God's hand and the miracles in our life because these pills aren't doing it for us. Well, and as we've experienced at times through trial and error, and we're obviously not perfect with that but Mm -hmm. i feel like one of our life missions and quests is to learn more about that to gain more experience Mm -hmm. in having that direct connection to jesus christ even if it means going against what we've been raised with Mm -hmm. our whole lives because i went through so much grief and heartache lots of tears just feeling so betrayed not just that well we were just lied to because it wasn't all lies it's just that how do you go against something like that Mm -hmm. if that was like i said for me my very core identity so i want to dive into a couple topics here that we've touched Mm -hmm. on because i want to see like how you've grown out of Mm -hmm. false beliefs Mm -hmm. so the first one being this idea that service equals blessings that's Uh why we do the service so um, I've had conversations recently, actually, with uh, True uh-huh. Believing members where they're like, well, if I pay my tithing, I get my blessings. Doesn't matter where the money goes. I pay my tithing, I get my blessings. Uh-huh. The question is, do you pay your tithing because you want blessings or do you pay your tithing because you love Jesus? So mm-hmm. what is your view on this service equals blessings mentality? And is that really what scripture teaches us now? I think at least with service equaling blessings, that's true to a point. I just feel like the church itself has inserted themselves as very much a middleman and that truly giving of yourself, whether it's 10%, less or more, is really more a matter of the heart. And am I giving it out of heartfelt sincerity to follow Jesus? And like in the scriptures themselves, it talks about giving up your increase, it does not have this corporate specific percentage of 10% necessarily, at least in that context. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, it's much more about giving freely and giving more, not just monetarily, but of our time.
time and energy, probably most significantly. And our hearts. And our hearts, Mm -hmm. literally. Again, for me, it was so much about external validation in Mm -hmm. the past and checking either a checkbox or qualifying for what is literally a VIP pass in the form of a temple recommend. And with my church employment, having that threatened if I didn't pay that. I think that when we love Jesus, naturally we will desire to serve and to give of our hearts, our time, our money. It's not this um, checking boxes or keeping score or tallies or anything. Mm -hmm. It's literally just an outgrowth of loving God. And Mm -hmm. it changes the perspective. Of course, God will bless us. Naturally, God will bless us. But also when we take the service equals blessings mentality, we also eliminate grace completely because it's almost Mm -hmm. like I have to do all of these things, even if they're (laughs) culty or I won't get blessings. But there's, where's the grace, you know? You're cutting that out if you're so focused like I admittedly was Mm -hmm. more often than not me too of well I'm paying this so therefore I qualify Mm -hmm. but in Jesus's view we have inherent worth as it is Mm -hmm. and I believe to truly follow him we give freely rather than having an expectation for reward which Mm -hmm. is admittedly so hard it's human beings. Absolutely. Specifically. Mm-hmm, for sure. Okay. Now give us some resolve to the worthiness complex. You've gone your mm-hmm. whole life <laughs> with like the shame just piling mm-hmm. on you. Have you felt healing from the worthiness complex since you have come closer to Christ? I would say I have found a lot of overall healing. I would, if I'm being honest, say I still have <laughs> some ways to go. That's okay. So do I. <laughs> But I I feel like I don't have this complex in general anymore in terms of I have to do these things in order to get blessings or I have to avoid doing these other things even though there, there are consequences from that. And I feel like getting to the point of accepting my own responsibility in terms of what I would say is radical responsibility and self-sovereignty independent of whether a bishop or state president deems you worthy is what's most important. So I still have my moments. I still struggle with stress and anxiety to different degrees, but not in the sense of I made this big mistake or seemingly big mistake. Do I have to go confess this like to a bishop Mm -hmm. because I thought of that a lot when I was younger again not with grievous sins but that was my understanding of that in order to feel good and for me it's much more now about having more of a direct connection with God Mm -hmm. and if he is happy with me and my efforts we have heavenly parents I believe in heavenly father and mother in Jesus and that we have a divine team, and that their perspective is much more of how can I support you and each one of us in terms of our overall life quest and goals, and what do we need for that growth, whether it's challenges or blessings. I'm not saying I discount asking for blessings. I just view that more in the sense of Asking for help in how I can fulfill what I'm here to do instead of having this deference to authority. Not that authority in the right sense is a bad thing because I don't believe that. I just believe that God is our ultimate authority in that Mm -hmm. sense. Absolutely. And when we know that, then we understand grace. And so we can feel worthy in his presence because he makes us worthy in his presence. Mm -hmm. And it's so healing, Mm -hmm. Uh, even though there's so, so much more to go for both of us, I'm sure, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it's very healing to learn and understand that. So Mm -hmm. thank you for sharing your opinions on that. Thank you. Okay, Jay, are your records in or out of the church? They're out. Both my wife, Karen and I made the decision a couple years ago to remove them. And like I gave hint to, that was not taken lightly at all. Like to me, 
in a sense, that was the end of a life, or at least the end of an identity that I've lived all my life for. And I probably spent about a year after we moved, Karen and I and our kids, in what I would call more of a year of contemplation or even a year of hibernation or being a hermit in some ways because we didn't have a lot of interaction, at least with our family and friends. And we made a clean break in the sense that when we moved, we did not attend our local ward congregation there because we were at that place where we were making decisions on what we felt we needed for us and our family. And like I said, it took a long time for me to come to terms with that. I very much agree with what Kelly said, that if this truly does have dark energy and can be viewed as a dark contract, we did not want Satan to have a legal right and claim on us. And that's what we need to do. Have you experienced freedom in Christ since doing that? I would definitely say so. Yes, because not just with considering, well, who is our authority now, which in my view is God, Heavenly Father, Mother, parents, and Jesus. I feel like I'm able to view my life in a more direct sense of what would God truly have me do rather than what looks good. All right, Jay, you've been through quite the journey in your life <laughs> and you've grown so much. And, you know, this overall theme we've been hitting about the hero's journey and how, you know, we do have a tendency to want to be the heroes in our story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I definitely think that the heroes in the Bible and the Book of Mormon, they did things that were out of the ordinary to follow Christ mm -hmm. and things that were probably considered crazy in their day. And, you know, you've really, you've done that in your journey. And I think that's beautiful. And I think the healing that you're experiencing and the healing that you are going to continue to experience in Christ is just going to be incredible in your life. So thank you mm -hmm. for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. We're going to wrap you. up this episode. Awesome. How do you find clarity in Christ? Yeah, so I view it really, as I know I mentioned earlier, as having a balance, specifically more in the sense of, a holistic balance that for me with a lot of my hard lessons that I've learned really involves physical balance along with mental, emotional, and spiritual. So I strive to have a holistic whole and balance with all that, whether it's exercising or even and some people may disagree, but a couple minute cold showers, fully cold showers really awakening the cardiovascular system for me really helps. And just also mentally and intellectually reading out of and studying out of the best books. I am in a few book clubs and I find a lot of value and worth in studying classics and even to some degree religious classics, even though we are unaffiliated Christians currently, I think there is still value in respecting and learning from other religions, even like Buddhist texts. And at least in terms of following Christ, I find clarity in striving to live a spiritual, pure life. And that includes morals that I still agree with and a healthy lifestyle that the church teaches. I very much still agree with keeping our bodies, minds, and hearts pure and clean and striving to live up to Jesus' standards to be able to have him in our lives and to have a very real personal relationship with him. And for all that and more, Jesus is truly my hero. I love that. Jesus is actually the hero and he should be the hero in all of our stories. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Finding clarity and balance and purity and realizing that Jesus is the hero in our stories. Thank you so much, Jay, for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Claire, and farewell. If you guys are interested in joining us for an episode of the Clarity Podcast, where you share your story of how you left mainstream religion to follow Jesus Christ, please feel free to reach out to me at clarity.podcast at gmail.com. You can also find me on my website at forgedinhisfire.com, or you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at forgedinhisfire. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us on this week's episode of the Clarity Podcast. <laughs>